Good afternoon, this is CIVE 634, Surface Water Hydrology, and this class is 15-2, meaning 15 weeks, second lecture. And my name is Professor Victor Pons of the Department of Civil Engineering of San Diego State University. The subject today is the second class on global warming with uh, practical applications. The first one is practical application. So today I am going to be covering I-05, six, seven, and eight. We may make it six, five, six, seven, and eight. And um, typically these uh, presentations, these um, papers and so forth that I prepared for this class and over the years actually um, have both a raster and a vector form. The vector form, as you know, it's like, uh, it's like this. This is a paper. And the, and the raster form is like a video. So today I have chosen to do, I watched the video the, the, this morning, the videos this morning and, and they were good. So I'm gonna show the videos today. So sit down, relax. Um, the stuff that is the content of the videos is the same content of the papers. The only difference is that the videos has more graphics and more pictures and videos, videos within videos attached to it. So I think it should be certainly more fun. So let's do that. Let's start with the first, video, then we'll go on to the second video, hopefully the third video. I am not sure if I'll be able to get to the four last uh, section in here. That one would have to, if we ever get there, if we get there, it would have to be um, vector because I don't have a video for that. Okay, so let's get going here. Effect of global climate change. Let me get it, this in here. Effect of global climate change on the white range of Peru. How did this originate? Well, several years ago, I was, um, when Professor Kinoshira uh, joined us in the year 2014, I believe, uh, we discussed the issue of global climate change and we decided to, uh, to go out there to Peru to examine the white range because I had uh, learned that um, it, it, the White Range is a, a glacier in Peru, in Northern Peru. So basically the, the short stories we went out there and, and uh, did some research for a few days, uh, field research to find out not exactly we weren't gonna go out there with instruments, but we were gonna collect all the information available at that time on site. And so we did, and with that information, it was about 10 papers. I produced this vet, uh, this uh, paper and video that we're gonna watch today. Global climate change refers to the accelerated warming of the world's climate over the past 50 to 60 years attributable to the burning of fossil fuels. Since the dawn of the industrial age, developed human societies have been burning coal, natural gas, and petroleum, ostensibly to power industry, urban development, and transportation. The excessive pumping of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is threatening to upset the delicate balance of nature. More carbon is now entering the atmosphere that can be removed through photosynthesis and other natural means. The most widely recognized indicator of global climate change is the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide measured at the Mauna Loa Observatory in you know. By the way, I just heard that there's a volcano eruption out there in Mauna Loa, and that is going to affect albeit temporarily, the measurements that are being done by uh, the son of the Keeling, Mr. Keeling, I think we already talked about that. Keeling uh, measured the atmospheric concentration 
in Manaloa, of carbon dioxide in Manaloa for about 50 years. Then he passed away and lo and behold, his son, I think his name is Rolf, uh, took over from his dad. Extremely unusual situation and very uh, good for all of us that count on them being able to do the measurements of the carbon dioxide into the future. Hawaii, figure one, shows a complete record to date, which spans the period from March 1958 to March 2019. Uh, this video is about three uh, years old, so it goes to 2019, 2020. I would have to update the video, and I'm going to hopefully do that in the future. Bring it down to 2022, which is where we are right now. See, for instance, here it indicates that uh, that the concentration of this dot in here, this black dot, is uh, 410, right? Yeah, 410. But now it is 419. That's from from 18 to it, it went up 19 uh, or nine rather nine points. So it's gone up and, and it's continuing to go up. As a matter of fact, it's going up faster than it used to be in the 70s and 80s. Why would that be? Huh. There's a reason for that. I'm not going to talk about it, but there's a reason for it. The red curve shows the seasonal variations, while the black curve shows the average annual trend. This curve is referred to as the Keeling curve in honor of Charles David Keeling, who started the record. It is clear from the record that the concentration of carbon dioxide, which was around 318 in 1958, has now, in March 2019, reached 410 ppm, all the while showing a definitely upward trend. These numbers show that the concentration of carbon dioxide has increased about 29% in the past 60 years of record. Most scientists believe that the rise in the Keeling curve is due to the excessive burning of fossil fuels, which once in the atmosphere tend to accumulate since. Around the world has been shown, I guess, that about 95% of the people, of the inhabitants in the world, uh, believe this situation that I'm talking about here tonight. I don't know how that figure, how that figure was gotten, but uh, that's the figure that's circulating, ninety-five percent. So that that means that not everybody in the world believes what I'm talking here today. There's a few people that are, I guess you could say, non-believers. There is no natural way of returning to the earth in the quantities in which it is being burned. In effect, the atmosphere is seen to be acting as a convenient dump for the excess carbon. How does the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide affect global climate change? In other words, how does an increase in atmospheric CO2 produce global warming? To answer this question, we need to look at the constituents of the atmosphere. A, nitrogen, 78%. B, oxygen, 21%. C, water vapor, 0.4%. D, carbon dioxide, 0.04% and E, smaller percentages of other gases. While the constituents of the atmosphere are subject to change in- This is a fascinating uh, graph that I found, I believe in Wikipedia, if I am correct, several years, at least 10 years ago. Look at this, oxygen, the green. There was no oxygen 2 billion years ago. All the oxygen was generated the last 2 billion years to the present. The oxygen, as we know, is generated through photosynthesis. So it, uh, it is when we had plants that we could uh, benefit from the production of oxygen. And therefore, the animal, the development of animals came about the last billion. Uh, people differ as to when do the first animals, living animals uh, developed, but the number is about six to 800 million years. Just very simple animals, not just, not just uh, animals like human beings and so forth, simple animals. Geologic time, they tend to be essentially constant when viewed in the time scale of human interest, say 100 years. The exception is carbon dioxide, 
which has increased about 29% in the past 60 years. In 1896, Svante Arrhenius published a paper entitled On the Influence of Carbonic Acid in the Air Upon the Temperature of the Ground. Arrhenius called carbonic acid at the time uh, uh, CO2 was referred to as carbonic acid. So there's no confusion here. Where he pioneered the science of global warming. He reasoned that the air retains heat in two ways. One, by diffusion, as the heat passes through the air. And two, by selective absorption, since some atmospheric constituents absorb great quantities of heat. Nitrogen and oxygen, the atmosphere's primary constituents, are homonuclear diatomic molecules, too tightly bound together to be able to absorb heat through vibration. The selective absorption of heat is accomplished by carbon dioxide and water vapor, two non-diatomic molecules which are present in the air in small quantities. This is the the stuff that I uh, referred to to professor from Canada, which, I, which I mentioned, mentioned or basically challenged me to prove that uh, what I was saying in one of our papers was correct. Because he said that carbon dioxide was too small of a constituent in the atmosphere to make any difference. He, of course, did not know the chemistry. Arrhenius knew the chemistry. These two molecules consist of two elements and more than two atoms bound together loosely enough to be able to vibrate somewhat with the absorption of infrared radiation. Eventually, the vibrating molecule will emit the radiation again, and it will likely be absorbed by yet another molecule. This absorption emission absorption cycle serves to keep part of the heat near the Earth's surface, insulating the latter from the cold of outer space. Other heat absorbing non-diatomic compounds such as methane and nitrous oxide are also present in the atmosphere, albeit at much smaller concentrations. Of the two more important non-diatomic constituents of the atmosphere, water vapor and carbon dioxide, only the latter has a clear anthropogenic origin. Water vapor varies in the atmosphere in largely unpredictable ways with no direct human influence in the time scale of analysis. The selective absorption of heat through vibration by the non-diatomic components of the atmosphere effectively means that these serve as a blanket to retain heat near the Earth's ground surface, impeding its diffusion into stellar space. Their concentration is an indication of the thickness of the blanket. Thus, a carbon dioxide concentration of 410 ppm ought to be about 29% more effective in retaining heat than a concentration of 318 ppm. That this is indeed the case is demonstrated by the record of global land ocean temperatures shown in figure three. This figure shows global surface temperature anomalies, the black squares, and their five-year running means, the red curve using a base period of 1950 to 1980. The data indicates that global surface temperatures have increased about 0.6 degrees Celsius since 1960. Thus, there is very good reason to believe that figure two is the cause and figure three the effect, and that the Earth's surface air temperatures are increasing. Since the burning of fossil fuels is the only process that can pump carbon dioxide to the atmosphere in such great quantities, it is readily seen how this activity, which has taken place in earnest in the past 50 years, may be regarded as the culprit. The effect that protracted global warming will have on the global hydrologic cycle, on the weather and climate, and on the world's ice caps and glaciers is now beginning to be examined. Here, we focus on the wide range of Peru, which features the largest concentration of glaciers in the tropics. It is clear that global warming is bound to significantly affect these glaciers. In order to get glaciers in the tropics, you need altitude, meaning high mountains. And Peru has quite a few mountains at elevations 
greater than in meters, 5,000, 6,000. A few, about six of them are above 6,000 meters, which is about 20,000 feet, by the way. The white range of Peru is located between 8 degrees, 23 minutes, and 10 degrees, 2 minutes. That's the white range of Peru, this one over here. This one over here is another range. It uh, has a different name. The white range is over here. It's the largest, well, not the largest. Well, I guess I would have to say the largest. There's actually three glacier groups in Peru. One in here, another in here, and another further south. Minutes south latitude, encompassing 122 mountain peaks with elevations about 5,000 meters, of which 15 of them lie about 6,000 meters. In 1970, the aerial extent of the glaciers was measured at 723 square kilometers, which comprised 26% of the area covered by all tropical glaciers. There are 755 glaciers in the White Range. As it is usual in the tropics, these glaciers are small in aerial extent, averaging one square kilometer, with only 12 of them exceeding five square kilometers. This figure shows the salient geographical features of the White Range. A, the outline of the basin of the Rio Santa or Santa River. B, the location of the snow-capped White Range along the eastern boundary. And C, the snow-free Black Range along the western boundary. Because the, following the Black Range, because the Black Range is a lot lower, it's maybe a couple thousand meters lower than the White Range. That is why it doesn't get any snow in there. One, principal mountain peaks above 6,000 meters elevation. Two, cities in the vicinity, Caraz, Yungay, Huaraz, and Recuay. Three, meteorological station at Quirococha. Four, glaciers Braji, Uruas Raju, and Yanamare and five, lakes with risk of avalanche. The effect of global climate change on the health of tropical glaciers is predictable. There is and will continue to be glacier melt, which depending on the extent of the recession may partially or totally compromise glacier integrity. The glaciers of the White Range are large compared to other glaciers of the tropics and therefore are likely to last longer. Smaller glaciers in Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador are either in frank recession or have already disappeared completely. This is a picture of the Espejo Glacier in Bolivar, Pico Bolivar in Venezuela. Note that 1910 coverage of the ice, 1988, and then the year, I believe it's 2000, something, let me see. 2008. The effects of global climate change on the wide range of Peru have been documented since the late 1960s, tropics, and therefore are likely to last longer. Smaller glaciers in Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador are either in frank recession or have already disappeared completely. Note uh, on the right side, 2008, there's no, ice or the glacier has disappeared from this Pico, Pico Espe, Espejo Glacier at Pico Bolivar in Venezuela. The effects of global climate change on the wide range of Peru have been documented since the late 1960s. Measurements on the Broji, Uruas Raju, and Yanamare glaciers are shown in Table 2, pointing to increasing recession rates since 1982. Moreover, recent studies of the Yanamare Glacier have shown that the average recession rate in the six-year period from 2003 to 2009 has exceeded 30 meters per year. Based on current recession rates, researchers have projected that the Yanamare Glacier will dis- When you see in here this lighter brownish area, that's the recession. It used to be covered by ice. The uh, Blacker areas here, greener, brownish, darker brown. That is older areas. You can see that that's clear. It's only a couple of years in here. 
or something on that order. Disappear within 50 years. The color indicates the age of the exposure after the recession. Yes. This figure shows Lake Kerokocha, located west and downstream of the Yanamare Glacier, with the glacier visible in the background. The figure, taken in 2003, shows that at that time, the glacier may have been much greater. The effects of global climate change on the White Range and other glaciers of the tropical zone are not limited to glacier recession. The effects encompass a gamut of related changes in different fields, including A, climatology, B, geomorphology, C, hydrology, D, ecology, and E, socioeconomics. These changes are described in Table 3. Changes in the white range are currently occurring and are expected to continue well into the future. Glacier coverage has declined by more than 25% since 1970. Furthermore, between 1951 and 1999, average temperature has increased 0.35 to 0.39 degrees per decade, significantly at an accelerating pace. Glacial lakes develop as a direct result of glacier melt. Glacial lakes? What is this? Well, it has to do with the geomorphology. If you have melt, if it doesn't run off, it'll sit, it'll sit around in lakes. And in this case, this particular mountain range is geomorphologically, how could you, how could you say, uh, favorable for lake formation. You can see in there, there's several of them. I can see I, I'm able to see just in this graph, one, two, three, four, five, and four in the corner. There's nine lakes that I can see right now, right Large in Large glacial lakes, particularly those with more than 5 million cubic meters of water, pose significant risks for local residents and infrastructure in view of the scale of the destruction that would ensue from an outburst flood. In 1953, a comprehensive glacial lake inventory Reveal the existence of 223 lakes in the 223 lakes in 1953. The White Range. 35 of the 223 lakes were classified as unstable, with 23 of them requiring immediate attention. With protracted global climate change and the rise in average temperatures, the number of glacial lakes in the White Range has continued to increase. In 1962, a second inventory resulted in a total of 263 lakes. By 1997, the number of lakes had increased to 374. Presently, the number of glacial lakes in the White Range is more than 800. Figure 8 shows the Nevado Waltan near Carwas, a typical example of a glacier featuring many glacial lakes. The growing role of melt during the dry season may be surmised. Overall, runoff has three sources. One, melting of glaciers. Two, direct runoff, which comes from precipitation. And three, base flow. In the White Range, researchers have reported significant differences between the composition of the average annual runoff and that corresponding to the dry season. For example, in Lake Erococha, Data indicates that during the dry season, melt volume is half the runoff volume, while the average annual volume of melt is only a quarter. The glaciers of the White Range have sustained the population of the upper Santa River for millennia. The entire region is referred to locally as the Callejon de Huaylas or Huaylas Corridor, due to its elongated shape along the river, flanked by the White Range to the east and the Black Range 
you can see the white range is much higher in elevation. The black range is at about 4,000 meters and it does not have, uh, it's not a glacier, it doesn't have ice on top of it. Black range compared to white range to the west. The population consisting of about 320,000 people is distributed among hundreds of small rural settlements with approximately half of the people living in major urban clusters along the Santa River, including the cities of Huaraz, Yungay, Caraz, and Recuay. Huaraz, a major urban center with about 120,000 people is the capital of the department of Ancash. The in the year 1941, I believe it was. Let's go back in here. In Huaraz, a major. In the year 1941, there was a, a glove, a glacial lake outburst flood, which came over through this valley over here from one of the peaks. And it came out suddenly, I guess, and it killed 5,000 people. It was a major landslide, I guess you could say. 5,000 people were killed in 1941 here. There was the worst uh, events, but events continue, have continued to happen. Your urban center with about 120,000 people is the capital of the Department of Ancash. The danger of glacial lake outburst floods and avalanches remains a threat in the wide range and very likely to be exacerbated by continuing global climate change. Table six documents the most important glacial lake outburst floods of the past 75 years. Oh, what did I say in here? Remember 1941, December 3rd, December 13, Palcarajo Glacier affected Huaraz, capital of the region. 15 meter high debris flow avalanche descended on the capital city killing 5,000 people, and then many others that have been documented. A total of 29 have been documented. There's actually a book on this subject that was put together by a gentleman from Oregon who went out there and did a, a doctoral thesis on the subject of glacial lake outburst floods in Peru. How uh, interesting. Since the year 1725, with the majority of them occurring in the past century alone, the cities affected have been Huaraz, Chavín de Huantar, Guayanca, and Caraz. Global climate change, specifically anthropogenic global warming, threatens to upset the delicate balance of nature, wherein the global climate is determined by the concentration of non-diatomic gases in the atmosphere, among them significantly carbon dioxide. The sustained warming of the past 50 years has produced a host of negative effects. I said earlier about something has happened in the last 50 years and I didn't want to talk about it at that time. You recall what I had said, I'm not gonna talk about it, but I feel I should talk about it, okay? In the year 1970, our, the country of China was not really developed. Uh, in 1968, they had the, uh, the agricultural revolution, Mao Zedong, remember? Uh, but then he died. In 1970, I believe he died. And uh, the gentleman that replaced him, I don't know what his name, I don't remember his name. I, I think his name was Chu Enlai, uh, as, as chief or president or premier out there in China. And I don't know, I wasn't there. I always say I wasn't there. But starting in 1970, Chinese society began to change completely. Some people say that it was because of the agricultural revolution, they suffered so much that they didn't want to suffer again. Whatever it was, I really don't know and I'm not gonna expound on it. But what I know is that around 1970, the people from China saw it differently and they started developing. Now, fast forward at 52 years and right now, 52 years later, China is a, is a world uh, power in everything, development, right? And by this time, there are more vehicles in China than in the United States in production as well as ownership. Why is that? 
because there is five times more Chinese than Americans. American population is 330 million and China has 1.5 billion. That means almost five years, five, five times, excuse me. So there's gonna, the, the pressure on development is more, much more in China than it is in the United States. Uh, the pressure in the United States have gone on for 100 and pressure of development, 120 years, plus or minus a few years. In China, only the last 50 years. But China is, it weighs five times more in population than the United States. So that I believe has been one of the, one of the reasons accelerating the problem in the last 20, 30 years, right or wrong. Here we highlight the effect that global warming has had on the tropical glaciers, including melting, recession, and their possible eventual disappearance. This places in jeopardy the continuance of a wide array of natural services, among them the supply of water resources. The supply of water resources, certainly jeopardy. Even in California, we uh, are supposed to be relying on the glaciers, the, the few glaciers that we have. But if those glaciers disappear, then we're going to have to find some other ways of storing the water. Uh, I, am, I know for a fact that the Department of Water Resources here in California it is already on top of it. They're already figuring out what to do because they are the ones that are responsible for overseeing the entire topic or subject of water resources for human use and human and agricultural use. In other words, urban and agricultural use in the entire state of California. And you know that here in California, water is not evenly distributed. Uh, towards the south, there's a lot of people and not, not enough water. And towards the north, there's the opposite. There's a lot of water and not enough people. Uh, in the past, uh, there was a plan many years ago, I don't remember, I wasn't here, that there was um, an issue about the water and people from the north were arguing, why is it that all this water is being sent to the south? And there was a meeting. I, I did not attend the meeting, but I know because I read. So the people from the north, Northern California were arguing with the people from the south, the politicians, the people in, in charge, that um, they didn't want to send the water because they, actually, I, I, they are actually sending a whole lot of water. There's two big dams out there, uh, uh, Oroville and Shasta. Shasta is a little bigger than Oroville, I think. Oroville is the one that almost broke five years ago, breached and broke. It was lucky, we were lucky at the time that nothing major happened, but we did lose two spillways at Oroville which were subsequently repaired at great cost. I remember that the original cost for the repair of the two spillways was, was tagged at $300 million. And by the time they finally fixed it, it was $1.1 billion. In other words, the estimate was short. It was about 25% what actually cost to fix those two spillways that, have, that failed. Why did they fail here in California? We're supposed to be good. And the answer is no, we're not that good. They failed due to lack of maintenance and poor design. Can you believe that? Department of Water Resources in the state of California, the strongest and the most populous state in the United States, and we still failed. The conservation of flora and fauna, the aesthetics of the natural landscape, and the societal activities of tourism, mountaineering, and albinism. We specifically focus on the wide range of Peru, a resource of global importance and significant aesthetic value. Peru is uh, popular these days. And I'm not saying that because I'm Peruvian. I'm just stating what the facts as I see them. There was an accident, a, a, an accident in Peru. It was not reported here in, in the US, but uh, I learned about it and I researched it on the web. I think it was exactly 10 days ago. Yeah, it was on the 20th. It was a Friday. 10 days ago, Friday, yeah, right. Uh, there was a collision on the runway between a, an, a plane that was taking off and a, and, a, and a fire truck that was kind of rehearsing or you know, they were doing some maneuvers out there. And of course, something wrong happened and the truck, the fire truck did not know that the plane was taking off and so forth and they collided. Fortunately, only two people, the people in the fire truck were killed. None of the people in the airplane, there were a hundred people in the airplane uh, were killed, uh, were not killed. Nobody got killed. Uh, the reason was because uh, the, uh, the firemen were on top of it and they immediately went and, and, and um, basically uh, 
dealt with the fire that had happened because there's always there's a tank full of gas and there's always a chance very like very likely chance that a fire will happen and that's why these fire men were practicing or fire persons i guess you could say were practicing out there just to make sure that um that uh, they do what they have to do when they have to do it and fascinating and interesting in this case there was a collision and there was a fire and the firemen were right there and they turned off or uh, uh, decreased or I guess you could say controlled the fire immediately and nothing major happened. But that's not the story. The story that I'm gonna tell you is that in the next couple of days, there was a lot of people in charge or not in charge that were talking about it. And uh, there's a company in South America, which is called Lat Latam or late, some people call it Latam, other call it Latam. It's a Chilean company. It's an airliner. They have about four, 500 planes. They're big, they're big all over Latin America, South America, actually Latin America. And one of the um, officials, I think the boss, the, the chief of LATAM over in Peru was, was interviewed by the press. And uh, what had happened, this, the situation at the time was kind of serious and they suspended the operation of the airport for about 24 hours, a little more than 24 hours, maybe 30 hours. You know what that means, to suspend the operation of an airport for 30 hours, that's a lot because there's a lot of flights coming in and going out. So they asked this guy, uh, the gentleman, the, the boss the, of LATAM, and he basically said something like this was really surprised me. He said, yeah, we were really affected because LATAM has 200 flights into and out of Peru and within Peru every day. 200 flights, one company. Now there's several companies out there. There's three or four companies. LATAM sure is the biggest company, the largest company. We, everybody knows that. Companies rate by the number of planes they have. And LATAM's got about 450 planes, right? So they fly all over. And they're one of the safest and more secure airlines. So what happened here, it was human error. It does happen every once in a while. Uh, and it happened, but I, I, I'm going to tell you this story because I believe that I was really surprised by knowing that LATAM was flying 200 flights in, in Peru. And that's a lot of flights. Life of all kinds stands to be negatively affected by protracted global warming and the impairment of the wide range. The following conclusions are drawn. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has reached 410 ppm at the present time, March 2019. It is actually 419, I checked this morning. The increase has been mostly attributed to the excessive burning of fossil fuels. Global average surface temperatures have increased about 0.6 degrees Celsius in the past 50 years. The rise in global surface temperatures has negatively affected the tropical glaciers causing a decrease in aerial coverage. The changes have been gradual, but the rate of change appears to be increasing. Average rates of glacier recession over the period 1930 to 2009 have been measured at 0.62% per year, and over the period 1990 to 2009 at 0.81% per year. A recent official study has documented that the loss of glacier area in the White Range in the period 1970 to 2003 has been 27%. The lakes have nearly doubled in number over the past 60 years, from 223 at the time of the first inventory in 1953 to more than 800 at the present time. Continuing glacier melting poses a significant threat of glacial lake outburst floods. The latter consists of water, snow, ice, and debris. If not adequately controlled, these disastrous events will spell havoc and destruction in the communities located directly in the path of the floods. Urban relocation, although a sensible decision in the eyes of many, remains politically difficult. There's a solution for this problem move the cities out of the path of the gloves, meaning the glacial lake out outburst flood. Move the city out of the path. And there's three of these four cities that I've mentioned are directly in the path of the flood. 
So they could be moved. Are they going to be moved? No, sir. I don't think so. That's just almost politically impossible. Many of these devastating floods have occurred in the wide range in the past 100 years, and the chances are that they will continue to recur. Relevant scientific understanding, coupled with enlightened interdisciplinary management, is necessary for the national government of Peru and its partners in the international community to develop an effective strategy to cope with these threats. Sustainability being clearly out of the question, the aim remains to mitigate and reduce the effects of global warming within the next one to two generations. Why did I say sustainability being clearly out of the question? Because this is not a Peruvian problem. If the Peruvians wanted to solve it, they could try, but they won't get anywhere because this is a global problem. And there's 240 countries in the world. Peru is only one of them. Okay, the next video that we're gonna have, we're gonna show in here is the 33 facts about global warming. I considered this morning where, where they're showing the vector of the video and I decided to show the video because the video is good, okay? I had uh, Jana Da Silva who was with me for three years uh, before the pandemic. He left, she left when at the onset of the pandemic, uh, she was responsible for many of the graphics that you have seen in that first video. Not this one, this one's the one that I produced about six months ago or at the beginning of this year. Why 33? The answer is that's a Kabbalistic number, right? If you guys know, <laughs> that's the age of Christ. Oxygen is flammable, we know that. And it's been said in the literature that if oxygen were to get to be more than 25%, it would be hell in the world. And the fact that it's only 21 means that it's kind of under control. We still have a lot of forest fires, but we can still survive, I guess you could say. Not survive, but we can still live with it. Early animals developed around 600 to 800 million years ago. And this is a mystery fossil. People really have studied this. They don't know what exactly it is, but it is a fossil recorded on the rocks. Ardipithecus, 5.6 to 4.4 million years ago. The species 
almost Homo sapiens emerged in Africa about 300,000 years ago. Estimates for the development of the variety Homo sapiens sapiens, to which all humans belong, range from 160 to 95,000 years ago. About 20,000 years ago, it started becoming warmer. The weather changed. So 21,000 years ago, the concentration was 190. The agricultural revolutions, apparently in, in, in China, 11,000 years ago, number has gone up substantially. I've been following this number as best as I could because it is a hard number to track, the global fl fleet of motor vehicles. But I know for a fact, since I've been doing this for more than 10 years, that it's been going up quite fast. Don't want to get into that, but you know why now. I already told you. Thank you. 
Okay, so let me go over here. And finally, we have some time. Let's move on to the next uh, video and I'm going to finish there, I think. Let's just move on and see what happens here. No, that is the, that is the vector. Let's go to the video. Something's wrong in here. Basically what I'm saying in here is that, um, that the plants, there's a balance between the plants and the animals, the a balance that mother nature put in there. If there are changes, the changes occur in, over a long period of time, okay? Uh, developed society came in around 120 years ago. Well, you know, that's the second part of it. In the, in the first part, it was not that fast or there were not that many people, but about 120 years ago, things took off and. And there was a, there's a lot more effect of what we're talking about here. But what happened was that um, there was a balance between plants and animals. But since that time, we, we started increasing the animals and decreasing, somewhat decreasing the plants. So that has caused an imbalance. For the past 120 years, humans have been engaged in a global experiment, which has apparently upset the delicate balance of nature. Plants and animals were supposed to complement each other, yet humans have increased the number of animals by way of self-propelled vehicles while reducing the number of plants through deforestation and other types of development. This has led to anthropogenic global warming. The solution, although seemingly far-fetched, is to decrease the number of artificial animals while at the same time increasing the number of plants. Barring putting a halt to development as we know it, carbon sequestration appears to be the only way out of the problem. Yet carbon sequestration remains a long way from being a practical solution to this intensely human predicament. Photosynthesis began about 3 billion years ago. Respiration began about 600 million years ago. Photosynthesis is carried out by green plants, which take carbon dioxide from the air, incorporate it into organic matter, and release oxygen as a byproduct. Respiration is carried out by animals, which take oxygen from the air, use it to burn organic matter, and release carbon dioxide as a byproduct. In nature, there is a dynamic balance between photosynthesis and respiration. Too much photosynthesis reduces the amount of carbon dioxide in the air and leads to cooling of the lower atmosphere. Conversely, too much respiration increases the amount of carbon dioxide in the air, leading to warming of the lower atmosphere. This figure shows the composition of the Earth's atmosphere through geologic time. The current levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide are about 21% and 0.04, respectively, for the past 250 years. But more intently, since the early 1900s, humans have been engaged in an experiment of global proportions by pursuing a type of development seemingly at odds with nature. In effect, by producing artificial animals, humans have been increasing the amount of respiration, while at the same time decreasing the amount of photosynthesis by eliminating a significant number of plants through the paving of formerly productive land. The net effect is a double whammy, which is reflected in the sustained warming of the lower atmosphere over the past 60 years. To put it in numbers, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the lower atmosphere has increased from 290 parts per million at the turn of the 20th century to 413 parts per million at the present time. 2019. In the past 25 years alone, the concentration of carbon dioxide has increased at an average rate of 2.2 parts per million per year. 
Photosynthesis and respiration are indeed opposite processes, and they both draw their inputs from the lower atmosphere. Therefore, the concentration of the inputs should roughly resemble the mass quantities in the terrestrial banks. In other words, the ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere should reflect the ratio of floral to faunal mass on the Earth's surface. Let's look at the first ratio using the 1900 value for CO2. The total floral biomass in the Earth is difficult to estimate precisely. The total live biomass is about 560 billion tons of carbon. In terms of organic matter, CH2O, the amount is about 1,400 billion tons. The total dry faunal biomass, including humans, is estimated to be about 2.5 billion tons. Therefore, the ratio of floral to faunal biomass is the proportionality between the two ratios is the dry biomass of humans is about 100 million tons. In terms of respiration, one automobile is equivalent to about three persons. Thus, we can add three times 100 million equal 300 million tons to the natural faunal biomass, 2.5 billion, to get the equivalent total faunal biomass of 2.8 billion tons. At the present time, 2019, the concentration of carbon dioxide has increased to 413 parts per million. Thus, the present ratios are. These calculations constitute only a start because they do not consider the decrease in floral biomass from stage one, 1900, to stage two, 2019 or the additional increase in equivalent final biomass, since vehicles other than automobiles have not been included in stage two. Note that the calculations shown here are not intended to depict actual numbers, only general trends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The solution is simple in theory, but difficult in practice. One, reduce the number of artificial animals, which are respiring too much and upsetting the balance of nature. And two, increase the number of plants to bring back the balance of nature. Yet humans have been doing exactly the opposite for the past 120 years. Transportation based on fossil fuels is regarded as the culprit, while the paving of roads to facilitate transportation exacerbates the problem. Paving produces permanent indirect artificial combustion, that is, a permanent way to reduce the uptake of carbon dioxide, effectively amounting to indirect combustion. In terms of mass balance, paving of the land produces the same effect as adding more vehicles. Barring putting a halt to development, a feasible course of action appears to be carbon sequestration, that is, extracting carbon from the atmosphere and depositing it somewhere out of sight. This would accomplish the same feat as if humans have somehow developed a way of producing artificial plants. Yet technically and economically feasible carbon sequestration remains a long way from being a practical solution to this intensely human predicament. <laughs> We didn't finish. Sorry. Something happened here. Oh, I, that's just the, the end of it. That's just the end of it. Okay, so we got a few minutes and let me just introduce the subject and then I'm gonna quit. The science of global warming, good, bad, or ugly. 
I'm just going to look at the pictures here. That's our man, Svante Arrhenius, Swedish professor, scientist, 1896. He wrote the first article, the first comprehensive article on global warming, the science of global warming, good, bad, or ugly. Why did I title it that way? Well, I guess you guys are too young to remember the movie, Clint Eastwood's 1961, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Remember that movie? Or have you seen it? I have seen it maybe five times over the course of 50 years. I like that movie. So that's why I like to, I, I decided to call this paper the, uh, the Good, Bad, or Ugly, because people don't really know. Is it good? Is it good science? Is it bad science? Or is it ugly science? Most people will recognize or agree that it is, and if, it, if indeed it is good, that it is ugly at the same time, because we're all responsible. We don't like it, okay? So Arrhenius was a genius, in my opinion. He, of course, talked about this idea of the, the, the carbon dioxide being the most important, um, not the most important, but the one, the heaviest concentration in the atmosphere and the one that would be responsible for holding on to the heat that is, that is given out by the earth. Heat by the earth? What are we talking about? Does the earth give heat? And the answer is yes. It heats during the day and the heat comes out during the night. And then it's held by the carbon dioxide so it doesn't get out. And then let, that leads to warming. That's all there is to it. Why does it come out during the day? Because it heats. It heats because the sun is out there heating. The sun is ultimately responsible for everything we do, right? You know that if you leave your car closed in the, in, in, during the day and it is very hot outside, your car will, be, will get so hot that it will be almost impossible to get in. You know that, I don't need to tell you that. So that is the issue. There's heat out there that needs to be controlled or managed. So heat is good. And then I said that the same time is bad. That is what our friend Machiavelli said in the year 1517. He said, there's nothing you can do that brings you something positive, which at the same time will bring some, at the same time cannot or will not bring something negative. And that's the issue that we're talking about here. Ice covered during the last ice age. The last ice age was very cold. It stopped or finished 21,000 years ago and made possible the development of, of the human being as we know it. Right, the human human being started developing about a hundred thousand years, but they really didn't take off until the Earth cooled. I'm sorry, until the Earth warmed in about twenty thousand about twenty thousand years ago. Europe was largely in, uninhabited, uninhabitable. You can see here, area uh, most of Eastern Europe was was under an ice sheet twenty one thousand years ago. Germany, yeah, Germany is out there. Uh, France, not so much because France has a lower latitude. But Germany and all these other countries out there, Russia, certainly out there. Anthracite, carbon mineral, that's the carbon. Where is it? It is in the earth. And it is in there because it was collected by nature. There was deposited and buried Put it put aside or underground by nature. How did this happen? Over years, over 300 million years, 300 million years, I repeat, all this coal was formed. High pressures, pressure and temperature produce the coal that we have out there. Interestingly, though, about 250 years ago, human beings discovered that there was that we needed to propel our engines and that we could use coal. You could just dig the coal out and use it. And at the time, of course, we didn't know because Arrhenius wrote his paper in 1894 and we were doing this in 1787, uh, the turn of the 1900. 1900, yes, the 1900. So we did it without knowledge 200 years ago. We started doing it 200 years ago. And then we got used to it. And then 100 years ago came Arrhenius and told us that we shouldn't do this or be careful. That's what he said. He, he didn't say we shouldn't do it. He just said, be careful because you're dealing with fire here. And we were, and we are dealing with fire but we didn't pay too much attention. Who is reading Arrhenius at this time? Nobody, but you guys, because I told you to read it. I gave it to you, okay? It needs to be read. I read it several times because it's a difficult paper. That's the basic uh, Keeling graph. We owe it to Charles Keeling uh, 
who showed us the data because this is very important because if there was no data, non-believers would say, show it to me, where are the numbers? You know, people say that, show me the numbers. So if you don't, if, if Charles Keeling had not been around and, and decided to measure all this stuff, we wouldn't know. And, and the non-believers would not be 5%, the non-believers would be 50%. We'd say, no, I don't believe this stuff. Poppy God, show it to me in numbers. So he decided about 50 years ago to measure this and he did it quite correctly and, and intensely, by the way. He spent his entire life, he was a chemist. He spent almost 50 years since, since uh, this, this figure here only shows the last five years. But Keeling started doing this in 1958 when he was young. And he died in the year 2018, I think the record shows. And of course, the, the counterpart uh, temperature. We know, we, we know that the Earth has been warming up. NASA has been measured the temperatures and we saw in the last video that the last six years were the warmest. That's an indication. This should be an indication. At this point, there should not be anybody out there that doesn't believe in this stuff, but there is. There's a certain percentage and it varies with different people believe differently, by the way. I don't know the actual record, but I know that country from country to country, there is a varying percentage on the number of people which do believe as opposed to do not believe in this type of science. The Gangotri Glacier in the Himalayas in recession. This graph in here has been discussed and some people like it, some people don't like it. Uh, there's also, uh, we know for a fact, because I've studied that, that in the glaciers of the tropics in Peru are receding for sure. They've been receding for 50 years and causing all sorts of other trouble. So there is an issue here. And finally, the issue is who is responsible for all this? And I don't want to call your attention, but there was a recent meeting over in a United Nations meeting, recent meeting, I think it was in, where was it, Egypt or somewhere out there? And they were discussing precisely who is responsible and who's, where's the money gonna come from to fix it, if at all we're gonna fix it. So it's interesting, the, 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 the conversation and decisions will have to wait until people around the world agree to, to agree. Basically, that's what they need to do, to agree to agree. We know that there's a problem, let's solve it, let's get together. That's gonna be a challenge, but it will happen. If it doesn't happen in this generation, it will happen in the next generation. I not only hope so, I believe so. So with that, I am going to stop the sharing here. And uh, we pretty much exceeded or used all our time in here. I hope you like the videos. I, I uh, attribute uh, half of the credit to Jenna, who, who worked, uh, learned from the beginning. When she joined us in, 19, in the year 2018, she didn't know anything about it. But I didn't know anything about it 12 years ago when I started. We learned it on a daily basis, and now we are good at it. Uh, I think Jana is a better editor than me. She's a younger person and so forth, learns faster and so forth. But I still do well, you know, in the editing. I think the first video that you show, no, the first, no, no, the second, no, the second, the first video was Jana's, and the second video was mine. Jana wasn't here when I developed the second video. So you can see the differences, but it really doesn't matter. The important thing is the message. Right? It is the message, the content that we really should go after. Thank you very much. So with that, um, I will um, uh, see you next Monday when we're gonna have the closing, the final lecture, it will be my final lecture at San Diego State. I call it very pompously farewell lecture. It is a farewell in some sense. That's why I don't wanna, I didn't wanna call it final. Final doesn't, doesn't, doesn't seem, doesn't sound right. It is a farewell lecture. I will come back uh, invited by, but it, it will not be in, on an official capacity. Right now, I am in the last strides of my official capacity after having taught here at San Diego State for 43 years. Thank you very much.